You've seen in the picture shows, I'm sure, the cowboys of our land. Walking tall and carrying a gun close by the hand. Mean and tough, because that's what it means in this tough world to be a man. Oh, I'll tell you about another kind of cowboy. I like to call him Cowboy Dan. Working, giving, simple living, Cowboy Dan. Never carried a gun, he didn't need one to be a man. Bring old outlaw hunger in, that was his plan. Working, giving, simple living, working, giving cowboy, simple living cowboy, working, giving, simple living cowboy dance. Welcome to Brethren Voices. We are in Huntingdon, Pennsylvania overlooking the campus of Juniata College with Andy Murray, who's a songwriter, a professor, a father, and has been a pastor. Mm -hmm. So we'd like to talk to you about all that, and I'd like to welcome you to Brethren Voices. Thank you. Nice to have you, and nice to be with you. Oh, it's... I, I'm saying nice to have you on the program, but we're actually in your house, so... It's nice to be at your house. <laughs> I'm so happy to have you in my house. Uh, been uh, just very interested in what Brethren Voices is doing, and I, I think, you know, I think not only what you're doing at this moment, but what you're what you're creating is a kind of record that's going to be important for years and years and years. It, it's uh, it's it's going to be the cash for the Church of the Brethren. To... Thank you. We actually have found that the Brethren Archives are, are wanting copies of the program. Good, good. And, and I'm not sure what they're going to do with them, but we have been really privileged to talk to some wonderful people in the Church of the Brethren and tell the story of what the Brethren do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're part of that story. Um, I'm, I actually met you in 1970, and you were pastoring a church in Portland, Oregon, which is our home church, the home church of Brother right, Voices. Right. But I'm curious about how did you get there? Were you, did you grow up Brethren? Did you, where did you go to college? How did all that happen that, with, which resulted in your coming to Peace Church? I, I was, uh, I grew up in the Church of the Brethren. My grandfather was a free minister. Uh, my grandmother was uh, on my mother's side, was a Sunday school teacher and so I have sort of deep Brethren roots uh, in the Garst family, and then my my father's mother was a Crumpacker, and of course they were very uh, active members of the church in Virginia. So, yeah, the Brethren stream runs pretty pretty deep. I went to college at Bridgewater. Uh, and for me, could, I don't know where Bridgewater is. Is it? It's in Virginia, in the okay. Shenandoah Valley. Okay. It's one of the five uh, sister colleges. Uh, uh, with uh, Elizabethtown and Manchester, uh, uh, and uh, is Juniata one of those sisters? Yes, yes. Okay. Juniata is one of the sister colleges. Yes. So, so uh, and I always, when I was growing up, I wanted to, I, I wanted to be one of two things: a pastor or a railroad engineer. Oh. And cool. and we lived in in the south in Roanoke, which was the home base for one of the last operating steam lines, the Norfolk and Western, and, which is now, I think, Norfolk and Southern. But, but eventually, steam disappeared, and along with that, my, my fascination with trains. Uh, loved diesels, but it just wasn't the same the thing. Same. And, so, uh, and so my, uh, then I thought, well, the other thing I want to be is a pastor, which was probably where I was headed all along. I mean, I was probably headed in that direction. And uh, after uh, I graduated from college, I took a year off and was pastor for uh, actually almost two years, pastor of the Little River Church of the Brethren in Virginia in the Shenandoah Valley while Terry was graduating from college. And then when she graduated, we went straight out to Bethany, which at that time was in uh, Oak Brook in Chicago. So after graduating from Bethany and having an experience in Wenatchee, you came to Peace Church in Portland, 
mm -hmm. based on, on a call because they, they were looking for a pastor. Uh, I, when I graduated from, from seminary, I decided that I had two criteria for a church. I wanted to go to the Northwest and I wanted to be in a city. And that pretty much limits you to <laughs> uh, Seattle or, uh, or Portland. Portland. Of course, Seattle had a pastor, but Portland was looking. Okay. And so uh, I don't know whether they contacted me. I may have contacted them or at least let the district executive know that I was interested in going to the Northwest. And that's how I got there. Wonderful. And you were there, you came in about 1970, 1969? Uh, 19, 1969. Okay. Yeah. And, and uh, that's, how I got to, that's how I got to Portland. How I met you is also an interesting story. Do you mind if I tell it quickly? Not at all. I, went, I, I know my version, so I, but I haven't when heard the, when the, uh, One of the reasons the church wanted me to come is they, they were anxious for me to work with, with the youth group. And uh, when I got there, I said, okay, where's the youth group? And <laughs> Well, there really wasn't. Uh, we had the two Sessler girls and... Uh, and, uh, and the El were the Eller girls? No. No, they weren't there. Yet. Uh, no, but um, uh, Terry uh, Mitchell okay. and her sister uh, were... Uh, and actually, Terry Mitchell was older, but her sister was younger and was in the... But, we really had three girls who would come to youth me. So, so we had this idea to start a production group that would do the Christian message, but using multimedia, film and music and dance and that sort of thing. But we didn't have any youth. And uh, Portland Church is right beside David Douglas High School. Correct. And I used to go and stand on the street after school each day. Uh, yeah, sort of, sort of, it's sort of like a guy selling picture postcards or something. Say, you know, call kids over and say, "Listen, here's what I'm doing. Are you interested?" And one of the people I said, "Yeah, I actually got a three or four guys that said, yeah." And one of the people I said, "Yeah, I'm interested." In that was your brother David. Really? Yes. And David said, "You know, I'm interested, but I'll tell you who would be more interested, and that's my brother Brent." And that's so we called you up, and that's how that's how you and I finally. I don't. How we got to meet. I yeah. don't remember that. Well, of course, I probably didn't know about that. A little, a little arrangement there. Yeah, so. yeah. So, wow. so you were pulled off the street. Okay. Indirectly. Good. I, I had no idea that you were out promoting the, the church <laughs> and the youth group there. So Absolutely. You could have one. In that time that you developed, was able to do quite a few things. Absolutely. By the time I left, we had 30 active members in the youth group. But I mean. They were from all over, and we had a band, and we had some dancers, and, and uh, uh, it was a fun, I, it was a fun project. And I, we, did, did we did a TV show. Three of them. Three of them. Three, t three TV shows for NBC in Portland. Amazing, because mm -hmm. yeah. I, I didn't remember any of those details. I just remember <laughs> we went to the studio and we did something. There. Yeah. And I got yeah. to see myself on television. Yeah. Which was, you told me later that we won some kind of an award. Yes. Or you, or the, the youth the group. group the youth group won. The, uh, we uh, won an award with the uh, with a Catholic group, uh, led by Father Leo Remington, who did the filming and things. And it was we won a Gabriel, uh, which is a, a fairly important national award given by the Catholic Church. We won the award, I think, in 1971, possibly, for the best religious broadcast by an amateur group. <laughs> when you left Peace Church, you came to Juniata. That's right. And I don't remember exactly what you were called to do here, but I think it was campus ministries or something like that. Yes. Yes. How did that? How did that unfold? And how were they able mm -hmm. to draw you away from from the, <laughs> from the northwest? Yes. Uh, they they drew me away because. Uh, all of our family was back east. We, we had no family out there. And both my father and Terry's father uh, were very ill. And, and so we really felt we needed to be closer home. And so um, uh, they, they offered me the job. I turned them down once and they held it open for a year and offered it again and I just couldn't turn them down again. And, and came in, I came to be chaplain and to be a part of the of the um, religious studies faculty. Um, and but pr primarily, my job was as chaplain. I also taught several courses each year. And 
as a result of that, you became a professor of religious studies. Well, I was I was hired as as a uh, an, as an instructor in religious studies, and then became an assistant professor of religious studies. At the at the time I was doing chaplaincy, the the school had been given a small gift for peace studies, and they were looking for people who would try to who would start that program. And I got involved with the group that was starting that program, and. Uh, as, as a result of working at that through the years, became a professor of peace and conflict studies. A full professor? Yes. Wow. So, Juniata is a brethren college. Yes. And you helped develop the peace studies program. So, what is, what is that at a college level? What does that actually involve? And what did you do as, as the, the director of that study? Our primary our primary focus was uh, was academic, and it was on what, what what we called an interdisciplinary inquiry into war as a human problem. So, what we wanted to do was to help our students to be more sophisticated about why people organize to kill each other, uh, to put it in kind of blunt terms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and so the the. Uh, uh, and we, we conceived of it as an interdisciplinary program, which meant that e every program, every department in the college could make a significant contribution to that inquiry, to, to helping us become more sophisticated, to, be, to better understand uh, the, the institution of war in human culture. So, for example, uh, the geology department worked, uh, worked on issues related to resources, to physical resources, uh, uh, minerals, and so forth. Uh, we had a, we had a, a program, or a, a course called Mineral Economics, Politics, and Law, which looked at conflict on a global scale related to where resources and are, are, are set. Um, the, well, we had a, courses in biology, which looked at issues related to the, the, um, to the brain and to uh, evolution. Uh, we had courses uh, in, of course, political science, history, sociology, um, uh, anthropology. Uh, anthropology, was, we felt, was one of, the, one of the really important places for us to focus because anthropologists dealt with with the whole issue of whether or not warfare is, is inevitable mm -hmm. in human experience. And have we always done this? Uh, and is there, is there, are there any societies, are there any cultures that don't do it? Uh, and uh, so that's, so, so essentially our, what our program did was to try to raise money and provide the kind of resources that departments would need to use some of their uh, academic tools to help us with this inquiry into war as a human problem. When you talk about interdisciplinary studies, were students from, were primarily science or, or political science, were they able to take classes in, in the interdisciplinary field? Absolutely. Um, they were able to, encouraged to, and not only did students take classes, uh, some of the classes that I would teach or that Celia Cook Huffman would teach, but, but professors in those disciplines also taught classes for us oh. as a part of our program. Okay, great. So, so we had classes in, in those departments that I, that I named. Uh, in, you know, we, had, we had a class in biology, had a class in physics uh, on, most, on nuclear weapons. Um, and we had a uh, class in geology that I, that I mentioned, so, yeah. Because I think for most people, when they think about peace studies, they think, ah, that really doesn't amount to much. But there's quite a bit involved, particularly when you study what does peace and war have to do with human society? Mm -hmm. And is it necessary, is it inevitable? And I think that would be a whole other program because uh, people have really strong opinions on both sides of that argument. Uh, absolutely, and and of course we we always were trying to work with those opinions. Our our approach was to look to to not make any assumptions 
and and we were just as hard on uh, peace through strength as uh, we were also hard on peace through love. I mean, we wanted to ask questions about, you know, why do we actually do this behavior, and what are what are the economic, the the psychological, uh, the sociological, the political, the historical reasons, the religious reasons that humans have this behavior, which is a, it's a it's a very odd behavior, isn't it? It's not found in in nature any other place. It really isn't, uh, except with some some ants and some species of rats. Um, I mean, do, do you have you have species that that attack each other on an individual basis, mm -hmm. uh, but but rarely ever as an on a, as an organized uh, behavior. Okay. And you did that at Juniata for forty years. Yeah, just about. And you've just retired. I retired about five years ago. Okay. Um, but I, and after I retired, I actually taught in the computer with the computer people for a while. Uh, so you retired, but you were still working. Teaching uh, digital audio production, yeah, which which I loved, uh, because in that, in digital audio production, I actually had answers. Mm -hmm. uh, doing religion and peace stu studies, you have really interesting and important questions, but you don't have any real answers. <laughs> And, 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 doing, it, and doing computer stuff, you, the questions aren't all that interesting, but you do have some answers, yeah. And at the end of the day, you can see that you actually got something yeah, to work. Yeah, that you got something to work, exactly. Are you working now, or are you, what do you do with your time? Um, I, I have a small studio, and I do recording. So you're, now um, we're talking about music. Uh, yes, okay. yes, that's just, yeah, just for music, but not my, not for me, but for other people I do okay. projects for other people, right? At the present I'm working on a real interesting project for the elementary school where their uh, parents and so forth do a band and we record the band in the studio uh, doing certain songs and then we take that tape to the school and the kids sing the songs with their parents playing and Really? And and then they sell the CD to their grandparents and aunts and uncles as a fundraiser. It's a it's a lot of fun. So wow. projects like that. Music has been in your blood since early. Yes. I don't remember how early, but did you learn to play an instrument when you were a child? Oh yes, as a kid I played harmonica and ukulele, and then when I was about ten years old, I think I picked up my first guitar, and. Uh, Never really became, you know, not, never really became proficient, but played and enjoyed playing and did enough that I could do my own music. Because you say you didn't become proficient, but you actually have written some songs. Well, I've made up some songs. Okay. Uh, yeah. Is there, what's the difference between made, <laughs> made up and writing? Well, I couldn't actually write down notes or anything like that. Uh, so I make up the songs, Terry writes them down. Yeah. Who does the words? <laughs> I do. You do the words. Yeah. So you're you're coming up with the tune and the melody and That's the right. words. That's right. Okay. You just yeah. don't have the technical. I don't part. read. I don't read music, so I can't actually say, "Oh, these are the notes." And and Terry not only writes music, but she plays the piano. That's right. And organ. And organ. Mm -hmm. And so, dulcimer. And dulcimer. Yes. She's a wonderful dulcimer player. I was reading in the Messenger that you just produced a CD. Yes. And that's from a long time ago, music from a long time ago. Is that, that music from the 70s? Yes. Oh, it is. Yes, it's, it's, from, it's from that album. It, it's just, the CD is just a digital master of the original uh, Nashville tapes and that, that were used to make the vinyl, okay. the vinyl album. Amazing. And after all these years, you know, after 40 some years, People still ask, you know, what, can I get the great body Todd bus truck race, or uh, and uh, can I get summertime children, or Cowboy Dan was on that album, um, Little John Klein, uh, a song Bring about John Klein now. was on that album. So and and people would still write, and Terry said, you know, we should just put it on a CD, and so that's what we did. So <laughs> this CD, which you've just produced, yes, is. A copy of that original album? Of the original vinyl. 
that you did in 1974, 75. 75, yes. Hunger is so big in me, most men they never even try. Complexity never bothered Dan, he was a simple man, so he took out his pencil, sat right down, and figured out a simple plan. Working, giving, simple living, cowboy Dan never carried a gun, he didn't need one to be a man. Bring old outlaw hunger in, that was his plan, working, giving, simple living. Simple living cowboy, working, giving, simple living cowboy, damn. He knew there were so many people, didn't have enough to eat. Figured a cow or two might help put them on their feet. He went all over this great big country to the farmers that he knew said, Hey brothers, I've got a plan, can you spare me a cow or two? Cows and sheep, and he loaded them on a boat. And he put them on the Atlantic Ocean, and he set them out to float. They sent them to the people in Spain, didn't have enough to eat. He said, Maybe, my friends, you could use some goats, chicks, cows, or sheep. But take this cow and milk it, friend. You know you don't have to pay. But on a winter's morn, when your first cow's born, would you kindly give it away? And take this chick and gather eggs. You know you don't have to pay. But take a few eggs and hatch them, raise some baby chicks and catch them, and kindly give them away. Old outlaw hunger is mighty tough. We may not bring him in, but we'll surely deal him a mighty blow. He'll have to take it on the chin. And it may help a lot of hungry people sort of get back on their feet. But we keep on, keep on passing on to those goats and pigs and cows and sheep. 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 This NYC will be the 40th anniversary of the, of the first theme song for a national youth conference. Okay. And, and that's, on this, that's on this CD. And you were talking about summertime children and, and Cowboy Dan, and, and they're all on here. Yeah. Fascinating. The, the real fun in the project has been people who've written to ask for it. And then they, they send me wonderful notes. Um, we put our children to sleep with this music. I'm not sure that's a great compliment, but <laughs> I, have a, I have at least five notes from people who say, we love this music and we, we still listen to it after our children were born and our children would go to sleep listening to music. I say, yes, some people used to go to sleep listening to my sermons too, but I guess that's another issue. <laughs> it's not uh, uncommon. But I, get, but I get really sweet notes from people saying, uh, uh, my husband and I got engaged right after one of your concerts or that sort of thing. So it brings back a lot of wonderful, wonderful memories. I, I should mention that Terry is very active in, in music as well. And in fact, as we speak, she's playing uh, for a retirement home, playing music, theater yes. music? For yes, them? yeah, for the nursing home. I mean, nursing. yeah, yeah, so it's a, yeah, she does that on a weekly basis when we're here. And uh, she plays, she does uh, old standard jazz tunes from the 30s and 40s. And uh, people just love it. I would think so. Yeah, yeah. That's right up the alley of a lot of the people who are. Or, or at that stage of their life in, oh, in yeah. the home. Probably. Yeah, and, and you know, it's a, nursing homes can be kind of boring places, and, and she, gets, she, she has a good time doing that. Do she you? occasionally gets people up dancing with their walkers. And, oh, I like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, one of the newest things that has come your way is being nominated as a candidate for the moderator of the Church of the Brethren. Mm -hmm. And... How did that happen? Was it a surprise? How do you feel about it? Well, it was very much a surprise. Um, it's not, I mean, it isn't a surprise in the sense that they, of course, ask you and you have to fill out this long thing and send it in. But I've done that for so many years for so many different positions and never actually made it to the ballot. Uh, so I always expect not to make it to the ballot. And uh, so, yes. Yes, actually being on the ballot was a surprise, a bit of a shock. <laughs> so when you discovered this candidacy was viable, 
You didn't go, oh, no. <laughs> you thought, oh, um, maybe I can offer something. Um, it, yes, yes. I mean, it, it's scary. I would say it would be for me. Yeah, but, um, uh, but also something that, that I'm happy to, to do. Andy, you mentioned working with the UN, mm -hmm. and I've never really had a chance to find out what the Church of the Brethren's connection with the UN and what, what kind of access you've had, uh, or as the Church had, with working on these big issues of peace in the world. Can you share a little bit of that? Mm -hmm. Well, sure. And, and the, uh, the Church actually had, I think, a, an official representative to the UN, Chantal Albaga. Bagot. Um, but we don't anymore. That's one of the things that budget cuts took away. My work with you and really didn't happen through the church. It was through, uh, through other channels. I was, uh, I was a member of a commission uh, formed by the uh, Department for Disarmament Affairs in the UN and the International Association of University Presidents. And I served on that commission, which, which essentially helped the UN make, uh, uh, make contact with and do programs with colleges and universities. Um, and I also, I also was a director for five years of a program called the International Seminar on Arms Control and Disarmament, which was sponsored by the UN and by the International Association of University Presidents, which brought uh, it, it brought instructors, professors from universities in conflicted regions mm -hmm. to uh, study for, they did an intense two-week study on uh, dis arms control and disarmament curriculum and then uh, finished up at the UN making a presentation and, and visiting uh, some of the, the uh, work that the UN was doing. A beautiful Huntingdon, Pennsylvania, overlooking the gorgeous and very wonderful Judiata College. This is Brent Carlson. And Andy Murray, wishing you peace. He didn't need one to be a man. Bring old outlaw hunger in. That was his plan. Working, giving, simple living. Working, giving, cowboy. Simple living, cowboy. Working, giving, simple living, cowboy. You've seen in the picture shows, I'm sure, the cowboys of our land Walking tall and carrying a gun close by their hand Mean and tough, cause that's what it means in this tough world to be a man Oh, now you know about another kind of cowboy I like to call him cowboy, rootin' tootin' cowboy, not a highfalutin' cowboy He was just a dunker plowboy, working, giving simple living cowboy dance